Welcome to episode 25 of Woo Woo for the Skeptic. I'm Kim Polander, your host and curiosity advocate for the world of metaphysics. Thank you to Violet for requesting today's topic, the Akashic Records. For anyone who is relatively new to spirituality, or not so new, I'm sure you've heard the term Akashic Records thrown around. I myself have always been curious about the difference between an Akashic Records session versus just a general reading with an intuitive or a psychic. I believe my guest today does a very thorough job of explaining just what the Akashic Records are, and why you might be curious to know more about your soul's records. My guest today is renowned Akashic Records intuitive, Tara Nitahara. Tara is a certified yoga instructor, Reiki practitioner, and accredited Akashic Records consultant and coach. For more than 20 years, she has studied, practiced, and taught yoga, meditation, and energy work. She holds space in the integrity of truth and light of the Holy Spirit, with the earnest intention to be of loving and uplifting service to all healers and seekers who find her through their desire to be assisted by this work in powerful and positive ways. And I've experienced firsthand her earnest intention through her focus on the growth and healing of her clients. Tara, thank you for being on the show and welcome. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. Now, tell the listener a little bit about how you kind of went through the process of being a just a normal person, so to speak, and getting involved with the Akashic Records. Uh, Yeah, that's really funny that you would phrase it like that, because I actually think that's the best thing that I bring to this field is I'm just a normal person. I do have a lifelong interest in spiritual growth and development and metaphysics, and I've got a whole lifetime behind me of trying different things and taking different classes, and, and I really like to be open to that. And several years ago... I had an Akashic record reading from a friend. I was in a point of personal crisis. Oh, I've been in points of personal crisis many, 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 many times. In fact, I started numbering them as a joke. So I'd say, <laughs> yeah, when I, when I was in my 20s, I'm like, wait a minute, why am I having a crisis now? This feels like a midlife crisis and I'm not, this is not my midlife. So I started naming them and numbering them. Okay, I'm experiencing early midlife crisis number 105. And now I'm definitely midlife. <laughs> and so now I'm just called them. Okay, I'm, I'm in midlife crisis number, number 300. So during one of those, they're funny, but they're not that funny. It is an actual crisis of some type. I mean, it can be an existential crisis or, you know, financial or relationship or family or, I mean, where are you going to live next month? Because you just, you know, that it can, it's real, real life. So at that point in time, I had, I was, oh, probably crying on the phone to my girlfriend. I felt like crappy crisis at that time. And she said, well, do you want me to open up your Akashic Records? And she had mentioned records to me. And in fact, she got me doing Reiki too. And I said, sure. And oh boy, oh boy. And she knew me and she was a friend of mine. The words that she used, the phrasing that she used, being on the receiving end of zinger after zinger after zinger of she'd have to be in my heart. She'd have to be in me and be me to be that right on about my experiences, about what kind of what to do with it, the what then. And so there, that kind of blew me out of the water. So then I called her teacher for a session, which took me a lot of guts because I'm sort of hesitate to reach out to people I don't know and, you know, put my whole soul and everything in their hands. And the same thing happened. I had the most amazing session from this person who absolutely didn't know me. I mean, she absolutely didn't know me. And it, she, there were words she used and phrases, and she got right into different feelings, and she helped me clear things out, and even just by looking at them, by facing at them. So I don't know who, who the author of this is, so I can't properly credit it, but that expression when the universe knocks twice, you know, to answer so I really pay attention to that so I'm like all right that's two and that's really different so I'm going to look into this 
I read everything I could find and I took everything I could find and that's not true. I picked one that really resonated and I went through the tail end of it and I did, oh gosh, a hundred hours of practicum and I, I'm still practicuming. <laughs> so, and it's happening for me too. That's why I'm like the greatest thing in my opinion is that I am just a normal person. So here I am and it's a skill set and I do think people have uh, proclivities towards different interests and different skills. And I mean, that's, I just think that's how we come in. So given that I'm just a normal person and going through all these different classes and practices and it's hard and it's scary and it's fun and it's exhilarating and it's, I don't want to do it. And it's, I can't wait to do it. And it's kind of everything. Now I'm like, Oh my gosh, I definitely hold space for people to have transformational energy experiences I completely do and it's not the me I mean I'm there I don't it's not an altered state of consciousness but it's you're not asking my mind what my mind thinks I definitely my ego steps back within it and we're asking somebody else like we're asking the records we're, we're asking the record keepers we're asking the Akashic records and getting answers and there's a flow and I have had one session. I, I count, I number them and I'm, I guess I'm into numbering. I keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I record every single one. I do. Whether it's with a paid client or whether it's, you know, oh, just for a friend or an exchange agreement I have. I count everything because I want to show myself over and over. Look, it happened again. Again, it happened. And there's this amazing poetry and this amazing flow to the session because then I'll be nervous for the next one. <laughs> And then, like, look, it happened again. Again, it happened. <laughs> and I'm hoping at a certain point I'll be like, all right, I've done, you know, 1,500 of these, and it's happened 1,499 times. So let's have a reasonable amount of faith that it's going to happen again. Yeah. Well, I love that you have been able to just capture and recapture the joy and the inspiration and the excitement about it. So I think that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Can you just give maybe one example of how your personal Akashic reading made changes or catapulted you into changes? How receiving reading or? Mm -hmm. Yes. What did it do for you? It's kind of like energetically clearing house, cleaning house. So one of my greatest frustrations in life is that I really should have my stuff together <laughs> more than I do. I feel like I've had every advantage and I'm really well resourced and I'm well connected and I'm good at research. I'm good at gathering data and analyzing it and I can communicate it reasonably well. And with all of that, you would think that I would have it more together, but there's still times in my life where I'm just so confused. You know, when you're having an issue in your life and you can't see the forest for the trees. So, I mean, I remember when I'm like, I couldn't even talk to a good friend. I guess I forced myself and I still could, but even just to say, I know I should know this, but I don't get it. I know I should see this, but I don't see it. I'm stuck. I'm lost. I'm in this tailspin, and I just need somebody to pull it apart. Okay, and this is why I was really, really picky about ever going to a therapist, because if I ever wanted a therapist, oh, man, I wanted somebody who already knew me for 20 years, and I wanted somebody who was completely inspired. I mean, I wanted somebody like ideally someone self-realized who was just doing this work for giggles and kicks. So I would pick out a few friends who really knew me and were, you know, had good intuitive and listening skills. Well, uh, the records can totally do that. It's amazing. And I'm sure other modalities can too. I don't, I mean, I know there's a whole bunch of ways to get to good, a whole bunch of ways to get to God, however that saying goes. But for me on the receiving end, I absolutely get clarity and understanding in a sense of what's the source of these issues? What's the origin of it? What do I do now? How do I make it go away? Oh, I have to sit with it? How do I sit with it? How do I reconcile sitting with that? Okay, oh, I want to change it. How can I change it? Oh, I can't change it. I got to be there with it. So just energetically cleaning house. I feel lighter and happier. And sometimes I really don't, I have to just admit, sometimes I do not feel lighter and happier after the session. <laughs> because, yeah, like, because when I go in for a session, I'll be like, I just, I want it all. I want to hear the hard, hard stuff. Because I can do the dance around the edges stuff on my own, go into my own records. I'm like, I want to hear the deep, hard stuff. Yeah. And it sounds like the records can give you all of that deep stuff. So yes. And who knows you better than you? 
So let's talk a little bit about what the records are then. Like, why do the records have such intimate knowledge of us uh, at a soul level? So I was sort of speculating as to what you might be asking me today, because you didn't provide me any sort of heads up, <laughs> which I think is perfect. But I'm like, I like spontaneity. Let's just wing it. <laughs> you're, you're smart. You're actually smart. And I think I was dreading this question because I have a like a, a visceral negative reaction to hearing somebody say something is something like the Akashic records are this. And I sort of recently identified why I have a visceral reaction to that. And it's because there's so many different aspects of all of these things. Well, how about this? What do the Akashic records mean to you? Like what's your personal definition of it? Well, okay. So here's as far as I can get so far. And I reserve the right to reframe this as I learn more. So the Akashic records, Akash, Akasha is ether. So it's an energy imprint of everything that you, me, any possible describable entity, a tree, a park, a person, a group of people, a business, a country, the whole universe, the galaxy, the however, anything you want to kind of draw a circle around Everything, all the intentions and the words and the experiences leaves an energy imprint throughout time and space. So this is across all lifetimes? Yeah, it's across everything. I mean, that's a little bit of a misnomer, right? There's so much more that advanced math and advanced science, you know, quantum physics and nonlinear math has proven and confirmed even in the last 20 years about the nature of space and time and the nature of nature and the nature of reality that has not still matriculated into mainstream society. It will, but we still grew up learning that the world is ABC and that math is one, two, three, and that I have a past and a present and a future. And really it would serve us to just suspend doubt and just be compassionate and say, okay, so I am a droplet of energy from the source ocean of all that is, to use sort of a, a really clunky shortcut metaphor to get on with it, and I have agreed to be constrained by this mind, by this ego, by this personality, by this illusion. I'm going to agree to be confused by thinking that what is inside me is actually outside me. And by what is outside me is actually inside me. I'm going to agree to that confusion. So we think that people who we interact with are outside of us and we care about them or sometimes we don't. And then we think that our, our mind and our thinking and our feelings and all that, we think that's us, the body. We think that's us, but that's really a separate mechanism that is to be used as a nominate, um, quote, um, Adriana del Toro, as a microscope to experience the world. Yeah, are you saying a microscope on ourselves, like a mirror? Yeah, like we have agreed to this constraint. So yes, okay, fine. If anybody wants to answer, the Akashic Records are the energy imprint of the past, present, future of all lives and everything. Okay, right. But if, you, if we're willing to kind of suspend out, be compassionate towards ourselves, and say, all right, I've agreed to live within this and experience a world within this relatively quite constrained human contraption that works within a mind does not allow me to recognize the reality that past, present, future is all right now. And that you and me are all the same person. Mm -hmm. And that it's all one. And it's, I love that Taurus donut shape. I'm really resonating with that Taurus donut shape. So yes, we're all great big one. And yes, we are smart, even within our construct and our, our constraints that we've agreed to. We are smart people, and we are capable of looking at a given issue or situation or experience from a variety of perspectives. But like I have a girlfriend who's a supremely gifted arbitrator. Yeah, she's an attorney. But she's very gifted, and she's able to help people see issues and conflict from a variety of perspectives. So if we are willing to extrapolate that to time and experience, then... Okay, then we are accessing Akashic Records, a giant blob of energy, but it's very specific to past, present, and future because that's all happening right now. That's all nowness to you and me because I am all that. 
So, I mean, you, you can be a tourist in the Akashic Records. Tell me about a past life. Fine. It's fun to be a tourist. Tell me about other life forms. It's fascinating. It's interesting. Tell me about, you know, miracles and magic and all that. I'm like, we have examples of that all the time. And if that's what fires you up, go for it because it makes life fun and interesting. And there's also the ability to say, I'm interested in that, but also I want to call into myself. I want to somehow activate into my soul's DNA and call into myself all the wisdom and all the power and all the compassion and all the love and all the skill from all the times that I've ever been a healer or from all the healers who have ever existed. So you can activate that into your DNA, which is sort of like a just a majorly supercharged affirmation. It's the level of the soul's DNA. Or you can deactivate stuff. We had um, in the American culture in the last hundred years this fascination with ancestry. So let's apply that to Akashic Records. Well, within your existence, meaning your physical existence, the physical body, but also the mental body overlay, Sanskrit word is koshas, these sheets, these layers, the energy body, the spiritual body, all of that is derived from an ancestral or genetic ancestry and lineage DNA, or it's a cultural like cultural DNA. So some of it is ours, like a little droplet me from the ocean. I'm going to drop it from the ocean. Some of this stuff that I'm feeling is mine. And some of it is not my crap. But because I've agreed to live in this culture, I've taken it on. Or it is my crap, pardon my crass wording, and I've seen it come from my family. Oh my gosh, my dad was like that. And his mom totally did that. And okay, if I remember back, she got it from her dad. And he must have got it from somewhere, but I'm out of touch with that generation. And you're like, well, I don't want to pass along to my kids. Like, what can I do to clean house? So then we ask the record keepers, what can we do? Or we can, whoever, if you already have gods that you work with, or energy, or colors, or flowers. I mean, there's so much help available. But we have to ask because part of our agreement here is free. We have a free will agreement. We have a free will agreement. And this used to frustrate the crap out of me. So I'm like, if I said a prayer and I said, God or whoever, please help me. Why do I have to say the same prayer again the next week to get the same help? You know me better than anyone. You know I need help with this. Why do I have to say it again? It's so frustrating, but it's a free will agreement. So you ask for help from whichever energy source you're already resonating with. And if you don't know, then we can ask the records. And every single time, like something or someone really loving and supporting the positive is sent through. And you can just clear out Again, it's like house cleaning up through your ancestral DNA. I had one client who did this massive clearing on behalf of the entire Jewish, I want to say spectrum. That's not the right word. Of course, there's not like a Jewish country, right? But there is still like a tribe and a, a DNA, like a genetic and an energy imprint DNA from that ethnic group and other ethnic groups. And of course, there's a whole spectrum and everybody's an individual and you're not an automatron or anything like that. But she did a healing during her session on behalf of the entire, like her entire culture. So, so it sounds like, you know, if you subscribe to the idea of past lives, we come into the lives with amnesia, so to speak. And so the records, it sounds like, is a great tool to be able to give us all the knowledge and the lessons that we had from all of our lives and existences. Yes. And I kind of want to say yes to the power of 10, because the issue of past lives has recently very much frustrated me. And I I feel like I have no right to say that I've got it all figured out and I'm good now. (laughs) And let me tell you all about it because I'm still grapple with it. But I'm frustrated. Okay, we're calling it past lives, but everything's happening now at a point of nowness. And if I don't entirely get that because I have agreed to work and experience this time with a constrained mind and understanding that requires me to not quite get that. But let's say I'm just willing to suspend that and be compassionate about myself. I don't get the past life thing. But what's juicy about what I find tremendously juicy about Akashic Records, and I'm sure probably other modalities, is 
When you go in and you say, all right, show me a past life where I've got this, or show me a past life that started this issue that's really causing me great pain, and you will get that answer. And then you can ask, what can I do? What can I do about that? What can I know to reframe that? What can I, who can I forgive? What kind of, how can I view this compassionately? What am I to do with this now that this awareness has been brought to me? Why would one random past life come to you? Because that's what you need to know right then. But if we're all one, how is it your one past life versus what if you were actually getting my past life? Because we're all one, right? So then what if you don't want to spend the next 20 years solving that problem or finding the person who already solved that problem and published it in Greek, you know, a thousand years ago? What if you just want to, how can I make this work for me now? I want the, uh, the application of it. So the beauty of the I don't quite get it is, well, hold it. It doesn't really matter. So I can ask for a past life that is going to highlight for me when this started for me. And I can kind of get over, is that my life that I'm getting or Kim's life or somebody else's life who I don't know? And then I can be like, well, hold it. And this is why I say yes to the power of 10. I can ask to be shown any past life from anyone, if I have permission, like I have to get permission, right? They have to have touched me. This is, we have to only work with permission in the Akashic record. So any past life that I have permission to access that can highlight for me why I have this problem that's really causing me great pain, that's paralyzing me. I mean, I have people who are shut-ins to say agoraphobia is just almost a trite word. Like people who are dis able by depression you wouldn't know it or people who are suffering and in physical pain most of the time you know there's also this is crisis based you know asking how what can I do and what can I know and what do I do and what do I do next Hmm. I like that concept of being able to access a life you know if you have permission and gleaning the lessons from that Yes. And I wouldn't go in and say, hello, hello, record keepers. I would like to open up the records of Kim. They'd be like, eh. So I, <laughs> so I give, I give permission to open up my own records. And then within my own records, show me my past life. I can still say my, I can say, show me a future. Oh my gosh, there's so much fun. Show me like the best Give me a sense to the best that I can understand through the contraption of the mind and the ego that I'm operating right now. Show me the best that another life form has to offer. You know, like something that's like our, for us, for humanity, like our humor is super, super fun and light. And then because we have humor, I think we assume that every life form has humor and experiences humor and so far from what I gathered, that's not necessarily the case, but they would have their own other things that are wonderful. Have you ever had just a general intuitive psychic reading done for yourself? Yeah, many times. Okay, so how would you explain the differences of just an intuitive reading versus an Akashic Records reading? Yeah, okay, that's a really good question. What is the difference? I want to answer it like this. If I'm out to coffee with a friend and she's telling me about her latest unhappiness, and your intuition kicks in, and you don't even really consider yourself intuitive, but you're just relating, and your intuition kicks in, and you say something like, oh, have you thought of blah, blah, or it sounds like blah, blah, or I feel like I want to tell you blah, blah. Okay, any of those intuitive comments? So the Akashic Records is the same kind of intuition like that, but again, it's like really amplified. It's so deliberate, intentional, specific, with permission, targeted, did I already say purposeful? Like mm -hmm. that. So I have your permission. We have a format. I have an agreement like within myself, like whatever I am told or I am shown or I'm feeling or uh, words, I have an agreement like that is not for me. That is for you. You're the one asking the question. So my agreement that I have to just always say it. And it's a very loving energy. It's a very loving and supportive energy. You're not going to be told terrible, scary, crazy things. It's a very loving and supportive energy. Yeah. And it sounds like you stay very much out of the process. You know, you're the accessor of the records, but, you know, it sounds like you really connect them to their own personal information. 
Yes, I'd say a final difference for me as a person doing Akashic Records versus having lunch and having intuition come in. The having lunch and having intuition come in feels much more diffuse and much more fishing around. And yes, a little bit confused about, I already know this person. Am I offering my opinion on this? Or am I projecting my own stuff? But of course, I mean, that's part of the beautiful serendipity and synchronicity of the universe that we are going to have lunch at a time when you are going to say something that is going to resonate with me. So I'm going to agree to that. And with the records, yes, there is still all of that. But for me, on the doing end of it, oh, it is so clear. I am really clear about my job and what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to say. And, and when I don't know, I ask and they tell us and we just do it. And it's magic and it's poetry and it's, it's not me. I'm in the room. I'm your witness that you and I are not going crazy. It's just super duper clear. There are a whole bunch of people who access Akashic Records and who help people that way and other ways that are probably exactly Akashic Records but called other things. So I am sure there are a huge variety of experiences of how people do things within it. However, my clients and people who come to me, we are moving big energy and looking at stuff. It's not so much like what are the winning lottery numbers for tomorrow. There are questions about romance and money and all that kind of stuff that you would sort of go to a stereotypical psychic or intuitive for. And then what the records would do with that is they'd be like, okay, not that they would dodge the answer. Let's look at the underlying, like what is the underlying vibration of lack or insecurity or feeling like you need to have love reflected to you and worth and value reflected to you in the form of a romantic partner uh, you know someone from quote the outside to help you know that the inside of you is good and lovable so they would take it deep and you still may get your answer about that but this is not the best modality for that you will still get answer oh maybe you know three months or six months or they're saying to go to this class and do that or oh, there may be some of that this isn't the optimal modality for that sort of stereotypical psychic stuff, which I also don't mean to disparage with my comments because there's people doing powerful energy work named all sort of different things. And I liken this to yoga. Like people go to yoga class because they want to have a rocking body unbeknownst to them. They get sucked into this spiritual path. So it's the same thing. So you can ask what are the winning lotteries for numbers for tomorrow? And the record keepers are like, Great time to lead that person through your blocks, what's blocking you, and look how you have abundance all around you, but why won't you let yourself allow it in, and what, why do you think that you have to strike it rich when you already have all this? And this you know, they'll take it however. So, Yeah, so it's like a gateway, a gateway drug <laughs> into deeper spiritual things. <laughs> so could visiting the psychic down the street. And I really like the concept of getting back to the whole free will thing. You step back and you're accessing their records because... And this is where my own personal view comes in. I don't generally talk too much about my personal opinions, but I see this a lot with clients, with friends where, you know, they're going to go to an intuitive and you need to be very careful about where they're getting their info. And it's not that they have bad intentions on their own. It's just, they're not aware of where they're picking up their information because on a personal level, I believe that we not only have past lives, but we do our lives multiple times. Like, I don't know how many times I've been Kim Polner, but I know it's been more than once. And so if I was to go to an intuitive who's just kind of picking info willy nilly, she might be getting info from, oh, you know, the last time that I was Kim Polner, I did this and, you know, this is going to happen. Well, okay. If you take a step back and look at the records and say, okay, you had a life. The records may not say it was as Kim Polner, but you had a life where you did this. Now, you know, here are some lessons, here are some tools, rather than saying set in stone, if you do this, this will happen. Because getting back to free will, when we redo a life, we have choices that can now change the path and change the course of that life. So I just really, I wasn't that familiar with Akashic Records, but I like that aspect of it. Yeah, and it's funny, of all the times that you and I have talked, this is the first time you've brought up your... This is at least the second time I've done Kim Polander done this life. That hasn't come up in our exchange yet. So that's interesting. You all have to ponder that. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of times, like you kind of mentioned or you alluded to earlier, where 
I've had friends who will go to someone, you know, maybe they're on vacation, go to someone on the corner, a psychic on the street, and they'll tell them, oh, no, you need to not do this because this bad thing will happen. And the sense that I get is that that intuitive was just picking up on their own fears and projecting it onto the client. So again, you know, not stepping back from a client, lots of weird things can come in that really aren't for the client's highest good. So yeah, I think I've never gone to a psychic like that. And I also kept fear of malicious forces that I couldn't see, didn't understand, didn't know about. I allowed that fear to keep me from, quote, doing energy work for about 30 years because I was afraid. I was afraid that I would, I feel like I want to swear, but I better keep it family rated. <laughs> you can swear, but I'll have to edit it out. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to swear. I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll maintain self-control. <laughs> when you go to a psychic that you don't know, first of all, you always want to call in the light and surround yourself with love and light. We always want to do that every day anyway. Oh boy, do I need to do a better job of that. And for our kids and our loved ones, I'm going to quote uh, Matteo Polisoto, our kids are not intended to be running around out in the open without prayer protection or energy protection. And that is not a religious comment. So some kind of energy protection for our kids. And that just means love. Just imagine a bubble of love around them. It's not hard. Imagine setting up a bubble of love at the front door of your house. And every time they pass through it in or out, they just get this lovely love shower. Okay. So I definitely allowed my fear of malicious forces or I didn't really particularly believe in the devil. I just didn't want to look at negative stuff. And I couldn't, you know, I, I don't really particularly see energy. I do on occasion see ours or see energy. But without being able to see, I allowed that fear to keep me from doing positive, happy energy work. And it was only when I finally, like, I got kind of pushed off the ledge of like, go do it. Go do it. What you do is you set yourself up with your protection, you have very good intention, and you just go do it. And I was I was so afraid I would mess up other people, that I was afraid that I would open myself up to negative things that I didn't want to hear about. And even if it's not your paradigm to believe in like voodoo or cursing people, there are still accounts of that power being effective and I was doing this whole ostrich head in the ground. I don't want to know about it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to be involved in it. I don't want to tune into it, which is sort of effective because it did make me not place my attention and my emphasis and my interest on any sort of black magic or anything like that. And also, it really also did not serve me because that substantiated my fear that kept me from doing the stuff I wanted to do. Like Reiki, Akashic Records reading, even, you know, teaching yoga, meditation, that kind of stuff. So this is when it's nice to be surrounded by like-minded people. I mean, whether you want to go to a psychic or whether you want to do energy work or learn about energy work, it's very good to energetically protect yourself. There's a whole bunch of different ways, very intention-based, and then you can clear out and cut ties you know, just whatever it takes to kind of keep yourself clean and keep your intention positively focused. So if you protect yourself in advance, if you have your intention be very loving and world service and integrity, that is what we can do. And then go out, go forth and do it. Do good deeds. (laughs) Yeah. And I think the Akashic Records modality really encourages a person towards empowerment and making those decisions. Because I've had clients who started trending towards, tell me what to do, you know, more towards the intuitive, like what will happen in the future? What is this person thinking? And that's not the type of client that's going to resonate with me. And so I don't work with those types of clients. But people who get into this, tell me the future, I need to know before I, you know, step out the door, should I go left or right? And it's like, You need to learn how to make your own decisions. What are the blocks that you've had in the past? Important to say in the past. And, you know, what can you do to take a step towards the future that you want? You know, really get people engaged into taking back their power and not being so susceptible to their futures already laid out because, you know, back to free will, create your life. Right. And also, I mean, what the record keepers would do with any of those questions is... 
again, as I had said earlier, is go deep with it. And I get it. I get it. Midlife crisis number five. <laughs> Remember the number taught me. We get so confused and like we're in our head and we get so confused and or I should say I do. I'm assuming that somebody else does too, but I sometimes get confused and I just can't see it. I can't see my way and I can't and I'm just lost. So I understand why a person would ask, just tell me if I should take this job. Tell me if is this someone I should get romantically involved in or am I hashing out the same patterns again? So, but the Akashic Records and probably other people and methods too would be like, all right, here's the energy there. Here's the energy that's coming through there. And let's talk about your fear of, you know, committing to a person that you don't fully know yet. So they're like, why are you even asking yourself to make a decision right now? You don't even need to try so hard to make that decision. Just enjoy your one moment with that person. And then if you have another moment you want to enjoy with that person, you enjoy that. And when you stop resonating with that person, you'll fall away. And there doesn't need to be heartache and pain. or there, Well, there often is, but there doesn't need to be a decision about that necessarily. So why are you preempting you don't even know that person. They're like a blank check to you. So gather more data. Why are you preempting it? Oh, because I don't want to invest all my energy and be burned again. Thank you. All right. Let's look at that pattern. Let's ask the record keepers, what is the origin of me investing a bunch of energy and being burned? Oh, and this also happened with my business. Okay. And also my dad. I saw him do that. And my parents did blah, blah after, you know, and then it's just this beautiful trace it back to the origins of, okay, at the very origin of this issue is fear of investing energetically so that I don't get burned again or fear of losing my energy. Okay, so that is assuming that your energy is a finite source and it's assuming that this whole pathway all along is all just a waste of time till you get to good with this person till you get to quote success with this company it's not enjoying the journey of it so do we need to look at ways to make this journey more fun for you because this is the it <laughs> this is the it <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you see how they trace it back? So like that's what the records do with that issue. And I'm pretty sure that when I talked to my girlfriend and when I called her teacher, the Akashic Records instructor who I then worked with, Jody Lavoy, a master of Akashic Records, I'm sure I had some kind of a crisis going on like that. That's should I stay or should I go or that kind of thing. And in both cases, you know, it was unpeeled and unpeeled and unpeeled and taken back to something where I could really see the origin of this crisis clearly and get self-forgiveness and forgiving other people. And just, you can just feel, oh, I feel like I need to make a sound like, wah, wah, like just big energy shifts. That's how it feels to me right now when I'm talking about this. So can you um, give examples of just how an Akashic Records session created changes in your clients' lives? I have right away people saying things like, oh my gosh, I just feel so much clearer. I feel so much more relaxed. I'm sleeping better. I feel so much better about myself. You can feel the energy shift, though. When people come in, and I don't need to keep using the word crisis because we're all kind of progressing and... I'm noticing that we are nipping these in the bud a lot earlier. So we're not always seeking out answers when we're at a point of crisis. We're, we're at a point of inquiry and openness and, um, you know, almost something that has kind of been niggling us for a while. So far in my experience, it still falls within the realm of relationship, money, abundance, health issues, that kind of thing. As far as my ideal client. I keep getting me over and over again, effectively. But, you know, there's a bazillion different aspects of me. Like, there's a bazillion different aspects of you. Yeah. And what I've noticed in my own practice is that, you know, a lot of times the issues that clients come to me for are things that I've either recently cleared or I'm currently working on. So, you know, it's back to that whole mirror thing. For sure. When you get several in a row or when you know, like, you've been just kind of thinking, oh, I know I got to look at that. <laughs> I'm really unhappy with that. You're like, oh, gosh, I guess the time is now. 
if a listener is wondering, oh, is, you know, is Akashic Records something that I should try out? What might be, like, what would Akashic Records be good for? If someone is wondering, oh, could Akashic Records help me with this or that? And you just did kind of mention all these things like abundance and love and that sort of thing. So maybe you did already answer that. I have 10 therapist friends who are going to kill me if they ever hear this, but (laughs) it's very efficient use of time in sort of a therapy setting. I'm not a credentialed therapist, but that's what I like it for. And that's the effectiveness of it is therapy that would take hundreds of hours. I don't know how long. Maybe therapy has really evolved lately, but it's the same kind of soul searching. How do I clear this? How do I change this? How do I be a better person? How do I be in less pain? How do I stop seeing this pattern in my life over and over? Because I'm sick of it. Even give me a different problem. I just don't want to have the same one again. (laughs) I don't really want a different problem. But if I have to say that to make this one go away, that's how much I want it to go away. Yeah, that sticky law of attraction. Yeah, you might have a different problem, but it's going to be the same pattern. (laughs) So, yes. Yeah, well, that would explain why your clients then sleep better and are feel better. Because like you said, I like how you described that of having your very best friend who knows you so intimately connecting people with themselves on a soul level, I would think would be really just very nurturing. That's what it feels like, but even better, because there's no agenda. There's no agenda. So It's all for you, of you, and about you. There's no friend going, well, and let me tell you about my dad. (laughs) You know, it's your time and your session. Although you may hear that in a session. You may hear like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm going to tell you about my situation. You know, if we're guided to share something like that, sure. I mean, that's all we've got to share. Oh, that's a super cool thing about the Akashic Records. And maybe all energy healing is they use what you've got. So if you're a medical person, you get all sorts of medical questions and medical calls, and you can use that. If you're like an expert in chakras, or if you've done a lot of color therapy, or if you love pets, or if you do home construction, or if you're a mechanical engineer, they are, I'm going to have to say they, the record keepers of energy, all the different forces, use that. And those are the clients who you get. Those are the people who you get are the people who you can help. It's just magic. Like, it's so magical. It's so magical. Yeah, it sounds very rewarding. It is. It is rewarding. But I know that extends that my comment of it's so magical. I know that extends outside of Akashic Record reading, too. There's something about this format, though, that really helps me be super clear that this is not me. But... If I just suspend doubt, I mean, and then if you are willing to expand that analogy to then the people who you can best serve come to you. And of course, the people who are serving you too. I must feel guilty like I'm in a session and all this great energy is pouring in for the person and I'm getting it too. And by the way, they're talking about my issue number 49, which I've been needing to look at for a while anyway. So what would you say to skeptics who don't believe in something like the Akashic Records? I made a decision a couple of years ago not to go into the, I'm going to convince you that this is real business. So I just, I don't know. I would just go tell them to go hang out with the trees and do what makes them happy. They don't need to do Akashic Records reading. They don't have to. There's so many ways to enjoy life and to allow things to unfold. Go pet their doggy. You know, go out for a run. Go surfing. That's church. You know, but for me, I did research and I did scientific research for myself because it helped my mind. And now I'm going to give a specific example so this can hopefully make sense okay so the behavior of a cork so once they are paired once they're like paired and bonded they always are forever so even if they are separated from each other geographically so through time or space when one change is made to one the other one changes but not in exact mirror is what they found, but in a way that complements. 
in a way that complements the first one. And I'm like, oh, that's why all the twins call each other all the time. That's why two twins will pick up the phone to call each other at the exact same time. That's mm -hmm. why my dad calls me right after my mom calls me, right after my brother calls me. And nobody said, let's all call Tara today. So, yeah. And this happens all the time to us. All the time what happens to me on the street is I see someone I think I know, and it's not that person. And sometimes I say hi, and sometimes I don't. I'm like, Tara, zip it to you know. I always know that I'm going to have I always know that I'm going to see that person who I thought it was, the actual person, later on that day. or And sometimes it's like a minute later and sometimes it's a day later. So that is because we are in a frequency entrainment with them at that time. So, so I don't really feel like I need to prove anything to somebody who doesn't believe in it. I, they can just, I just want them to be happy and do what they want to do. For me, it really helped me. And my mind to buy into this, to have done some of my own scientific back work. I don't work out math problems or anything. I don't feel the need to do that. But I do feel cravings to research more about why this works. And, for example, grounding, electric grounding. It bugs me all the time how people say, Go ground yourself. Get grounded. I felt so grounded. Oh, she's really grounded. I'm like, what does that mean? We just bandy about these words. Go ground yourself before a session. Ground yourself after a session. And like, what does that mean? And they'll say, oh, you know, like, imagine the roots of the trees going down into the earth or eat some protein. Or I'm like, no, 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 no. You're giving me examples of how to do it. And that's great. Thank you. Because I'm, I'm going to find some. But what does that mean? And I'm looking that up and but that's the skeptic of me. What did you find that grounding means? Well, that the energy community was incapable of properly <laughs> describing it to my satisfaction. But the electrical energy community, the science community, did a way better job. So you're having an electrical storm, and the electricity is going flipping everywhere, knocking down trees, taking, you know, killing people on the top of their heads. You know, fireworks shows. Okay, you've got all this energy. But if you have a grounding wire, something for that energy to charge slash discharge into the earth, that's what channels it. And then you can, of course, use that grounding wire to make it go anywhere so that it's not an unwieldy force for destruction or force for creation. Like we think of starting, a, you know, lightning can start a forest fire. We think that's very destructive. But if you're trying to cook something that's very, that's very constructive, right? So it's a perspective thing. So in the same way, energy grounding would then help to discharge that energy and to direct that energy. So you would have this sort of nebulous energy that then through grounding, it could then be I'm a little halted because there's a couple different aspects of this. One aspect of grounding is discharging. And like if you're angry, you know, pounding a pillow or that kind of or, or screaming or yelling or rather than holding it all inside and uh, having the grounding wire or your visualization of the energy going through the bottom of the feet and into the earth is a discharging of that energy. So that's one aspect of it that I'm getting right now. And then the other aspect of it is direction. So we all know people who we say are brilliant but not grounded. Well, imagine if they're grounded because then they're brilliant and they're inventing stuff. Then they're brilliant and they're going off and teaching other people and, you know, Four of those people are creating new. So, yeah, I love that answer. I've never um, thought about it that way. I have to go to the scientists for this stuff. That was my first exercise for myself is just try to suspend doubt. Because I always thought it was so intelligent of me to be cynical and to come up with all sorts of reasons of why this can't be true and this can't be the case. And I finally realized, oh, I'm totally shooting myself in the foot. If I'm willing to just suspend doubt and allow myself to see what happens when I pray, what happens when I write these stupid flippant affirmations 30 times, what happens when I say I love you, I love you in a mirror, what is my scientific empirical experience of this happening, so let me just suspend doubt and then be like, holy crap. I'm not kidding you. When that year I did the vision board at the vision board party. So I sat there for an hour and a half and I did a vision board. I got everything I asked for that year. And I asked for huge things. I had like 
Bentley car. I mean, I didn't ask for a Bentley, but I, I had that represent a luxury car. I asked for like crazy material, giant remodels. I asked for like romantic love in my whole life to be organized. And by the end of that year, I'm like, oh my gosh, I kind of forgot that I had it. And by the end of that year, I'm like, okay, so therefore, the scientist in me would have to acknowledge that the vision board technique is effective. Yeah, I'm with you on the empirical evidence, and I'm all about the experiential because you can, someone can tell me something all day long, but until I try it out and take notes and see what happens, I'm not going to believe it. So, yeah, and the thing is, the other thing is, when it does happen, when you're informed, when you've informed yourself through your own kind of research or your own data gathering, regardless of how detailed and how scientific and how methodical you are, regardless of any of that, then when you see it happen and you experience it in your real life, wow, like it's so powerful. Then you can really, really appreciate it because you're still having that thing happen and you're knowing the mechanism by which it happened. Or you're at least knowing that somebody really smart can understand the mechanism by which it happened. And yes, you could slog through the pages of physics to get there, but you're going to leap to the end of the chapter. You know, you're going to reach the highlights. But that makes it more magical to me. I didn't know that was an Einstein quote, but before I read it, I realized I'm like, I wanted more magic and more miracles. And I realized, okay, either there's no such thing as magic and miracles, or it's all miraculous. So you can't have it both ways. Then like years later, I saw this Einstein quote that was kind of something like that. Who are we? to look at photosynthesis and not think that is magic in action. I mean, to this day, I swear, if you want an example of a medical miracle, it is the cataract surgeries, unbelievable. It is arthroscopic knee surgery, unbelievable. Same day surgery to, to get your knee back to good. I mean, if you don't want to count those as miracles, then I think you have a sad life. Those are miracles, they're grounded miracles. Yeah, and I've known people who really um, have issues using the word magic or say cynical, sarcastic comments about the word magic. And it's just like you said, it's like, how do you define it? And if you are so closed off to the concept of it, then that's uh, probably an indication of other things. But yeah. Yeah, and there's a point at which it's a semantics play. And I actually think semantics is a very relevant part of this conversation because if you are interested in energy worker exploring the world and you have a problem with using the word God because it's an old white guy with a beard in the sky and like a really old school paradigm in your head that you threw out when you were a teenager and you thought it was goofy and you're actually an atheist or you're an agnostic. I mean, you whatever you are, but if you allow the word or the usage of the word or if you notice that everything is expressed in terms of masculine wording and that pisses you off and you need it to be feminine or if you just want to know you just want to read the chapter without somebody writing his her <laughs> you're like <laughs> uh, you know don't overindulge me with the masculine feminine stuff i get it we still have language and we're still trying to communicate like to this <laughs> at some point at some point are you going to play the semantics game with yourself? Do you want the conversation and the content to be about the wording? Or do you want the conversation and the content to be about what's behind the wording? Like what's really trying to be conveyed? Yeah. Do you want to be right or do you want to relate? Right. And I do think you could have it all. But I swung really heavy in some of those. I swung really heavy with God and the universe and Jesus and all that. And it really bugged me. And I watched it limit me and limit who I look to for answers and inspiration. And the same thing with the masculine feminine thing. It's like a, I can see in my mind's eye a pendulum. Like the pendulum swings way far out this way, and the pendulum swings way far out the other way. And at a certain point, you're like, all right, okay, I'm good with it. I'm good with it because these are just people doing their best to express their ideas. And all they can do is use the wording that they've been taught to use. And then when they have a realization in their own early midlife crisis, number three, when they have their own realization that, hey, we're, hey, our language informs our reality and we're using masculine male, male, male words. And, but really the energy of creation is feminine. So if we're going to use anything, it should be feminine. But anyway, it should at least be there. <laughs> 
right? So then you incorporate that fairness. So then you have an obligation to yourself to, you know, be circumspect and inclusive. And at a certain point, it, well, at least for me, it kind of norms out. I know someone who's, I mean, she's self-realized and she does not use the word God in her sessions because it's a trigger word for people. And then I know other people who do wonderful energy work and they're like, they believe completely and they are doing all their work under like the auspices of Jesus. Yeah, I try to stay out of the labels thing. I would love to interview someone who is involved in traditional religion, maybe a minister, but also is uh, into energy work to kind of bridge that gap of it doesn't really matter, you know, what you call it, God, source, universe, because we're all just kind of tapping into whatever resonates with us and whatever resonates with us gets us closer to our soul and to that pure energy. Right, exactly. All right, Tara. Well, before I let you go, I was wondering if I could ask you a few fun questions to let sure. listeners get to know a different side of you. Okay, sure. Uh, so the first question, did you have any crowning achievement or something you were proud of in middle school? Or what kind of a student were you in middle school? What kind of a... Um, I was a very diligent student throughout my whole life, including middle school. And I went to a very small public school in Portland, Oregon, and we had a like private school quality education in small. We can do that in small groups, right? And <laughs> fortunately, there were a couple other people in that school with me who were also there were a bunch of other people who were very academic and because otherwise that wouldn't be enjoyable to be in a small group setting if, if you don't have other people to kind of spur you on. And I remember one of our classes was art. So we took art classes and I learned a lot about art. And I don't really consider myself particularly artistic at all. But I mourn the fact that my two girls did not and have not received one day of art instruction in middle school. Not one day of saying, here's how you draw. Here's how you use charcoals. Now let's try oils. Let's build perspective. Now we're going to do 3D paper mache. Now you can do any project you want. Not one day. So I sort of, that kind of breaks my heart. And um, so school, art, and then my tiny little school, we, um, we, we all had to play every sport. So You had to? <laughs> or else we wouldn't have a team. We, <laughs> there were only like 14 girls and seven boys. Like everybody had to play every sport or we wouldn't have a team. So we played every single sport and we lost pretty much every game because there's no vetting. And only Michelle Braverman was particularly athletic. <laughs> the rest of us were just kids who showed up. And I would get every single time I'd get most improved. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is so funny because it's actually more telling to how bad I was in the beginning <laughs> than like my diligent work ethic or anything like that. But I recently shared that with little kids. My kids were both very athletic and I joke with them, lucky that you have your mom's genetic DNA because <laughs> of course it's my husband that's a part of that. But it was such a wonderful gift to have to play every sport. And it was a wonderful, wonderful example to get to play you know, basketball and volleyball and running and all these things that I otherwise wouldn't, I would have been weeded out <laughs> for most of those sports. And just to keep showing up, even though you lose over and over and you're going to lose, and it's a matter of how bad you're going to lose, but it's not about the losing. It's about the pulling it together and trying a sport. And I don't remember being depressed for years of middle school that we lost our sports. Anyway, it was a different era, but. Oh, that sounds like a great experience. Yeah, I grew up in a small town, so I understand that whole. Yeah, and it wasn't a small town. It was just a small school. Oh, okay. And wonderful okay. to have that within. It was Portland, Oregon, so a medium-sized city experience. We're right next to downtown. It was kind of a you-can-have-it-all growing up. It was very nice. I, I like Portland, and I really like how Portland has matured. It's just beautiful. I cannot do the cold, wet, and gray, but I to this day, I do still have very good skin. Thank you, Portland. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> For I, yeah I grew up in the Northwest, so I, I yes. agree. Yes. Um, and then second question is, what do you like to do on your day off? Um, I'm a mom, so I don't resonate with the term day off. <laughs> <laughs> Even I mean, I'm not changing diapers. I have one in high school, one in middle school. Now I'm not changing diapers, but I drive. I'm a driver. 
and I, I cook and I drive for my kids a lot. And I recently, I used to hate cooking. Oh my gosh, this is how I believed and how I learned to believe in the power of prayer is I used to absolutely hate cooking and I started fervently praying that dear God, please make me love cooking. And I, I (laughs) like the kicker is I did that tongue in cheek. Like I was kidding. There was no way that was going to work for me. I would just kind of say it as a joke. Well, darned if it didn't work. And now I love cooking. And then I also had my very, very recent epiphany is I realized I actually like driving my kids around. It's fun. I bought myself leather race car driving go. I mean, Santa, <laughs> Santa bought me for Christmas leather race car driver gloves. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah, Santa did. I'm a technical driver. I got downtown driving. I got freeway. I got kids. I got dogs. I got other people's kids in the car. Like, this is serious business, and I enjoy it. I'm going to buy myself the gloves and Take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, well, I really admire the glove aspect. I wonder how many uh, carpool carpoolers have <laughs> driving gloves. That's awesome. No one. I, I, I expect <laughs> to start a trend. Yeah. I expect, I'm not kidding you. I expect everyone in my community to have driving gloves, mm. a la Tara. Absolutely. You could brand your own line of gloves. Yeah, no, nope, no, nope, not my calling, Kim. Let's leave <laughs> okay. that to you. All right, one thing at a time. Lastly, what is the number one thing on your bucket list? Oh, oh, it's embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. I'm going to force myself to say it. My number one thing on my bucket list is I really want to be self-realized, which is a funny, funny thing because there's no amount of yearning or trying that really gets you there. So I want to have awareness of my awareness. So I can sort of feel myself nibbling away at that in terms of realization or I kind of notice when I mentally come into a block of, oh, at a certain point, I just don't get it. And I'm much nicer to myself about, okay, that's part of my mind mechanism that I came in with that just doesn't get it. But I can still sort of put a mental placeholder for different existential points that I think someone who's fully self-realized would just accept as a given. So there, that's my number one thing on my bucket list. And it's really embarrassing. Why is that embarrassing? I know it shouldn't be. Um, It should not be embarrassing. I think it's so intensely personal. It's my most important thing. I'm embarrassed to put it out there because it makes me think that I'm being arrogant, that I'm good enough for that, that I'm close to that, which tells you that I have a goofy values overlay. I'm valuing more highly someone who's self-realized and someone who's not. And Someone who self-realized is unlikely to share that value and is probably at the point of cherishing the humanness because they don't stop being human. You know, you don't stop being human at that point. You just It's just all put into perspective and the experiences and the crises that we have, we still have them, but we just aren't apparently hooked into them as much. So there. It's not a trip to India, even though I want to go to India. It's not a sexy answer, but that's that's what. I- no, I I love that answer. I had one, only one other guest who actually gave the same similar answer. Of um, I, I think she may have referred to it as enlightenment. Sure, but um, yeah, I I really like that, and I resonate with that with that desire or that intention. So yeah, and I have a feeling I'm selling myself a bill of goods because I'm sure the responsibility is tremendous. And from what I've been told and heard, it sounds like life is actually easier where we are (laughs) now, (laughs) you know, to just sort of wake up and be a human person and, you know, make it to your 11 o'clock and make it to your three o'clock and figure out dinner and get your taxes done. That's apparently much more comfortable than having more wiggle room and more opportunity and more knowledge and more ability. So I could... I am aware of the fact that person X is suffering. I could say something to that person and change their entire experience of that episode that they're having and minimize their suffering. Or am I not to do that because that would be interfering in their own personal growth and development? And would I, in fact, be ripping them off of their own conscious development and growth by doing that? And by the way, they haven't come to me asking for that help. But I probably need to just enjoy where I am right now because I can see how having that responsibility or 
the conversations that we're having now, these are luxury conversations. They're bare bones conversations, but these are luxury conversations. We, we have food on the table. We have fresh water. We live in a peaceful land, you know, and now we get to talk about, you know, Maslow number five. Now we get to talk about self-actualization. And even if we're not going to be enlightened, we get to say, who am I when I'm at my very best? What do I love to do? How do I want to apply the very best of me to make the biggest possible positive impact during the time that I'm here? I know that's bare bones, but that's a luxury conversation. So I think I probably should just be at the point of enjoying the luxury of having of my existential crisis, numbered or not. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, maybe that can be your number one A thing on your bucket list. <laughs> oh, one A. <laughs> yeah. Gotta remember exactly. All right. Well, Tara, thank you so much. I really love your passion that you bring to your work. And I'm sure that is picked up on by the listeners. So if anyone wants to contact you for a session, what's the best way to find you? Sure. My website has every way to contact me. And it's akashiccoaching.com. It's A-K-A-S-H-I-C coaching.com. Or you can just text me or call me on my cell phone anytime. Thank you for listening to Woo Woo for the Skeptic. I would love to hear about your experiences listening to the show, as well as any topics you would like to see highlighted. And if you enjoyed this episode on the Akashic Records, please share it with your friends. And now for your moment of woo. This quote comes from Irish poet W.B. Yeats, who said, The world is full of magic things patiently waiting for our senses to grow sharper. Have a great week, everyone.